What's up guys? This is the Musashi Study Series. Some of the most motivational stuff that I've read is usually biographies. I think a lot of people these days when they see people that have quote unquote made it, uh, they believe, you know, that it was like an overnight success. Like they, like this person woke up one day and all of a sudden they were, had everything they ever wanted or everything the person looking at them thinks that they want when the truth is really much deeper than that. Like these people put in time, they sacrifice lots of time to develop the skills or develop the body of work that they, um, that they have um, over time. So that's why I really love studying biographies. Uh, so the, and I thought it would just be very, very fitting for us to start with Miyamoto Musashi. Uh, being that this channel is called The White Musashi. So, in the last episode, we went over uh, Musashi's early life. So, quick recap. He grew up uh, in Japan, obviously. Um, he, his dad and mom, his real mom either died or just disappeared. Nobody, there's kind of conflicting documents on that. So, Musashi's father uh, married another woman called Yoshi Yoshika. They end up divorcing. And Musashi, thinking that that's his real mom, moves with her to live with them in a neighboring town. And then as he's living there for a while, he has like two stepbrothers and, and some uh, stepdad. And as he's there, he's like, he finds out that his father is actually a famous swordsman uh, and a master of the martial arts. He was actually considered best in Japan at that time. So Musashi, seeing that, kind of looks around one day, he's like... Why am I not training with my father? And he leaves that family, goes stays with his family. I'm not sure what exact age that is, but he trains. And then around eight years old, uh, he is um, watching his father uh, carve toothpicks. And as his dad's sitting there cutting toothpicks, he starts ridiculing his dad. Uh, and that was something that I think his dad was dealing with a lot. Uh, Musashi, at a young age, was kind of a troublemaker and just kind of a bad kid. So he, his dad loses his temper, takes a sword, throws it at his son, sticks in the side. His son, and, you know, Musashi's kind of, obviously, Musashi's a little bothered by that. So then uh, it continues until his, da his dad finally forces him out of the house. After he forces him out of the house, he goes and lives with an uncle uh, named Dorian. Dorian was a Zen monk in the novel Musashi. He learns from a guy named uh, Takwan. Takwan is a real character, but there's no uh, documents that uh, confirm that he ever met that guy, that he ever met Takwan. Takwan was a, uh, I think he wrote a book called Zen in the Art art of swordsmanship there we now we have it uh, troubled troubled childhood bouncing around between families lives with a Zen monk for a long time and then around 12 or 13 he uh, a samurai is coming through the town puts up a post says hey does anybody here want to challenge this samurai M Musashi not telling anyone goes up to the sign says I will kind of defaces it and throws paint ink all over it he ends up fighting this guy. There's a lot more details. You might want to check out the last episode because I don't want to get into all that. We need to move on to other stuff. So basically Musashi ends up killing that guy with a wooden sword. Yeah, so today we're going to go over the Yoshiokas. The Yoshioka, the duel with the Yoshioka clan is one of the most popular stories uh, by about Musashi. It is actually where he developed what they call the two sword technique. This is interesting, especially for me. So if you're new to this channel, one of the main concepts is about living the twofold way, which is kind of dividing your time between having a more mental art and a more physical art or your peaceful art and your killing art. Uh, so in here, uh, it kind of mentions that some authors suggest that Musashi divided his time between training in his art and Zen. The young Musashi must have avidly pursued the practice of the sword, being still too young to conceive in concrete terms, as he did later, of the need to progress spiritually in order to advance in the way of the sword. 
All right, so it's duel against the Yoshi Yoshiokas. After the eclipse in the data for the period following the Battle of Sakagara, Musashi reappears in documents at the age of 20. So between the age of 13 and 20, uh, there's not much being documented. There's an eclipse in data. And then it go, goes on to explain how between the age of 20 and 30, of, 30 years of age, he fought 60 times in 10 years. This is an average of a duel every two months. In the logic of those days, nearly every combat was to, to the death, which means that Musashi placed himself each time in a situation where he could be killed or would kill his opponent. Looking back on the period later, Musashi wrote that he had fought in more than 60 duels during his youth, but that on reflecting on this after he had reached an age of 30, he realized that his victories had not been due to the perfection of his art, but rather to the weakness of his adversaries and also to chance. So yeah, after Musashi has had 60 duels to the death over a 10 year period, but that, okay, so after he's done this and he's reflecting on uh, doing this at the age of 30, he realizes as victors, his victory had not been due to perfection of his art, but rather to the weakness of his adversaries and also to chance. He says, if he had encountered superior Ada, he would not have survived. After this moment of realization, he went on developing his fighting art, which for him was inseparable from the art of life altogether. Thus, we have reason to believe that Musashi entered a period of introspection at around the age of 30. The most significant combats during his stay in Kyoto were those against the Yoshioka family. They took place in the spring of 1604. The Yoshioka family, for several generations, the Yoshioka family performed the function of sword master to the Ashikaga shoguns. The Ashikaga shogunate came to an end in 1573. Musashi's father fought in his youth against the Yoshioka Kenpo Munasai, Musashi's father, won two out of three bouts against the Yoshioka and received the title of best in Japan from the Shogun. So around 1604, Musashi travels to Kyoto. At the time, there were eight schools of swordsmanship that were called the Kairu Schools of Kyoto. Kyoto. Schools of Kyoto. It is thought that these eight schools were founded by eight monks who had received teachings from a legendary master from the sacred mount mountain of Kurama. The Yoshioka school descended from one of these branches. So the Yoshioka family uh, was in the textile business. So they had a unique dye that was unique to the family. One thing I just read right here was the structure of the swordsmanship of that time was there was multiple schools and they would all kind of practice against each other and learn different things. Well, at some point they became merchants and they only practiced within their own school, which could be the reason that Musashi beat them because they, it sounds like to me, like they weren't as open to other techniques or other schools. They were really good at their time and they kind of stuck to their own way. Sounds like they, they kind of just got stuck in their ways. Uh, so we're about to get into the actual duel. So uh, Musashi arrives and at the time uh, it was hard to get uh, a duel with some of the masters. So like, you know, you got the family, you got their school, and you have like the two sons and they're known as the two best but they were actually a pretty rich family so the thing is you couldn't get a duel with them unless you were known to already be like a really good swordsman and Musashi was not known at this time but they knew his father his father had already had dueled like their grandfather so they allow him to come to the school uh, or they, they have a meeting place outside the school where they have their duels uh, it says that there's documents that, that came from the Yoshioka school that uh, <laughs> say that Musashi only fought one, one of them and, and only beat one of them and that that person, the Yoshioka, won. <laughs> the reliability of these documents seems to be highly questionable. Okay, so brief, brief rundown. I believe it's 1604 or so around that time. He decides he's gonna, uh, he wants to prove himself, so he goes to the top school, one of the top schools in Japan at the time, the Yoshiokas. In the book, it goes over some brief explanations, which I just finished reading, uh, about three or four different stories of this, uh, of their duels. Um, it's a pretty interesting story. It's, it, it's actually three different duels. So, 
he challenges the school, the school fights one son, then another, and then the whole school decides to jump, jump him. So, now, this is the best interpretation. I'm going to read it to you. Check it out. The Yoshiokas had a reputation of being at the top of the heap among the eight schools in Kyoto, whereas Musashi at the time was an unknown. It was difficult for the principal master of the Yoshioka Dojo to accept a duel from him. So yeah, at the time, they would not accept duels from just anybody. You had to be kind of known. Musashi presented himself by a letter as Miyamoto Musashi, and he added that he was the son of Miyamoto Munasai, who in the past had fought the father of the present principal master of the dojo and won two bouts out of three. The name Enmi Ryu literally means circle of light school. The idea of a circle evokes perfection, that of the sun or moon towards which Musashi strove in his work on the way. The form and light of the sun and the moon were the essential inspiration for the swordsmanship. So after Musashi sends his letter in, Sejuro, the principal master of the school, replied immediately to Musashi's letter, informing his acceptance and leaving to his opponent the choice of place and time of confrontation. Musashi thought it was best for him to fight somewhere outside the dojo, because he did not want anyone else to intervene. He also requested that if he won, his victory should be publicly recognized. The duel was set for the morning of March 8th in the field by the Renjai Temple, just outside Kyoto. The Kyoto school, of which the Yoshioka school was a part, was renowned for its subtlety, for the variety and speed of its techniques. And speed and subtlety became more and more important factors in techniques. At this time, this is a time when you know, gunpowder was being introduced, actually. And so armor didn't really help as much because, you know, a gun would shoot through the armor that they had. So, you know, big swords, big heavier swords, you know, you would need more power and strength and just to cut through, to beat down that armor and then get through to the person. Now, people aren't wearing armor anymore. So they're wearing regular cloth. So what they're saying is speed and subtlety is a lot more effective. So the Kyoto school excelled in this new form of swordsmanship. So this is a newer form of swordsmanship. And that's also the reason uh, Musashi was, that's why the two sword technique, which we're going to find out very soon, uh, that's why the two sword technique was just now being developed. People didn't use two weapons before then because the weapons were a lot heavier and you had to like use two hands to swing it into the armor. Yoshioka, Yoshioka Sujiro arrived early, ready to fight. In this duel, Musashi uses a, I guess you can call it a technique, where he uh, wants to irritate his opponent. So um, at this time, especially in Japan, it was a big deal to always be on time. You have certain manners. You always present yourself in a clean manner. You always, and you, uh, yeah, and you show up on time. Well, Musashi knows this. And he knows the type of people he's dealing with. So he shows up late. Not just a little bit late. Two hours late. Because he knows that in that time, he's sitting there thinking about death and what could happen. And how negative thoughts could start just building up in there in his opponent's mind. Yeah. So Musashi was able to imagine what was taking place in Sujiro's mind. He saw anxiety about the confrontation arising in his opponent's mind. The longer he had to wait, the more images of death images of death would arise. His imagination would generate fear, and he would begin to experience his body as heavier than usual. He would make every effort not to fall in with his opponent's strategy. But the more he labored against it, the more firmly the negative images would implant themselves in his mind. In the absence of the other, the combatant on the field would pass through repeated moments of dread. But it would be a mistake to be too late, for Yoshioka could then leave and declare victory, saying Musashi had not appeared for the fight. Even though he had set the place for the duel himself, why he had to irritate his opponent within the limits of his patience. So yeah, so yeah, Musashi had to kind of gauge how long he was actually going to, how late he was actually going to be because his opponent could just 
declare victory and say he never showed up and just and walk off and so when Musashi arrived Sejiro was indeed irritated at the time of pre presenting themselves formally Sejiro is said to have uttered a number of insults Musashi is said to have responded calmly with a smile which would have annoyed Sejiro even further both combatants took up wooden swords and faced off at a distance of about six meters they approached each other little by little each one searching for the moment to attack. Musashi was naturally better at using the terrain to his advantage. He always trained outdoors, and this was an ingrained habit for him. Whereas for Sejiro, this consideration was doubtless not a spontaneous one, since he trained for the most part on smooth floor of his dojo. At a certain point, the two combatants closed in on each other, and both struck at approximately the same time. Musashi's sword struck Shojiro's left shoulder. Musashi did not make it a second attack, respecting the agreement for the duel at which combatant would make only one decisive attack. Yeah, I'm not sure if I said that earlier, but uh, that was one of the things, is they were using wooden swords, and they were basically uh, decided on one, basically one decisive blow. So he struck his left shoulder. In the novel, I might add, that he did strike his arm, and he broke it, and and it, it, in the book they describe his arm hanging almost a foot longer than normal. Pretty interesting. That's the novel, so I don't. That's not like the true story. So Sujiro lost consciousness. So he hit him in the shoulder so bad, so hard that he lost consciousness. But thanks to the care that was, he was given, he revived. However, as a result of the blow to his left shoulder, he became incapable of using his left arm. He had been crippled and suffered a definitive blow to his, to his honor. Thus, he gave over his responsibilities as head of the school and became a monk. With Sejiro's retirement, his younger brother, Yoshioka Denshinchiro, whose level of attainment was considered as good as his brother's, succeeded him as the head of Yoshioka Dojo. He was a very strong and accomplished practitioner. This time, it was Yoshioka who would put the challenge to Masashi as a matter of revenge. Musashi accepted immediately. The duel took place either on the outskirts of Kyoto or on the Sanjuran Du Temple in Kyoto. Uh, there's another document that says that the duel took place in the exact same spot. Densen Chiro decided to use his favorite weapon, which was either a simple staff reinforced with steel rings or another quite unusual weapon, a long, thick staff about a meter and a half long, whose end was hollowed out and concealed a steel ball attached to the end of the chain. This was a weapon that required exceptional strength to wield, which Denshichiro possessed. Musashi used the same strategy again, irritating one's opponent by arriving late. By the time Musashi arrived, Denshichiro had already was already quite nervous and irritated. According to the documents, Musashi tore Denshichiro's weapon from his grasp and used it to deliver a fatal blow. From this, the conclusion is usually drawn that Musashi initially faced his adversary empty-handed, and in the course of the combat, when the combatants were already entangled in very close quarters, he dropped his own weapon so as to pull Disenchero's weapon away from him. Yeah, so I'm not sure that was quite as interesting as the the, the original story, because the, the other story is that he, with, I believe, the first blow, hit him right between the eyes and killed him. Uh, but in this one, I mean, it's almost just as cool. <laughs> he took his weapon away from him and beat him with his own weapon. The, Mus the news of Musashi's, these two battles, get out to the whole school. Of course, everyone knows about it. M whole town hears about it. So the students are, have to defend their honor, and they all decide to jump Musashi. The news of Musashi's successive victories against the Yoshioka brothers spread rapidly in Kyoto. To restore its family reputation, the Yoshioka clan challenged Musashi once again. They took as a nominal head Sejiro's eldest son, Matsunchiro, who was 12 years old. Matsunchiro was a 12-year-old. Individual combat was no longer in question. I mean, that's, that's interesting because Musashi actually killed someone, his first person, at 12 or 13 years old. So now, the next in line of the Yoshiyokas is a 12-year-old boy. So individual combat was no longer in question. This confrontation was a battle for the family reputation. They prepared themselves with archers and riflemen. The number of combatants was several dozen. Musashi accepted his challenge. 
The place of combat was set for near the large pine trees of the Ichijoji Temple, located east of Kyoto. Musashi adopted a different strategy from that of the two previous duels. This time, thinking that his adversaries would expect him to arrive late, he decided to arrive early. He wrote in the Scroll of Fire, It is harmful to do the same thing several times in the course of combat. You can do the same thing twice, but not three times. As he approached the place of points of the combat, for the combat. He passed a Shinto, a Shinto shrine and found himself before the altar of God. He was just about to start praying to ask for divine help in his fight, which he could expect to come out of alive only with great difficulty. When he suddenly realized the significance of his gesture, I was about to ask for the help of the gods and just because I was about to face very powerful enemies, whereas ordinarily I never pray to the gods. Musashi then withdrew his hand from the string of the shrine bell and kept himself from ringing it, as is done to awaken the mind of the god of the shrine. So, he's heading into battle versus multiple opponents. In the multiple dozens, I think it says. And he stops at the shrine to pray. And then as he's praying, he's like, I've never prayed before. You know, it's like, and, and one of the things about this is like, you know, one of Musashi's sayings is, Pray to the gods, but don't depend on them for their help. Something along those lines. Respect the Buddha and the gods without relying on their help. So that, that comes from Dakota, which is Musashi's uh, book, uh, The Way of Walking Alone. And that's the book that he wrote uh, just before he died. So, at dawn, Musashi was already at the combat site. He had been informed that the nominal head of the Yoshioka party was a child of 12 or 13 years of age. Musashi was the same age when he killed his adversary in his first duel. Hidden behind a bush, Musashi observed the arrival of the Yoshioka for forces in the dawn light. He had to determine the number of guns and bows, but the most important thing was to locate, locate Mata Shichiro. When they arrived, the Yoshioka forces thought Musashi would be late as usual. Musashi always comes late. Here, we would do well to read what Musashi wrote in the Scroll of Fire, ripping out the bottom. To rip out the bottom in this situation, the head of the force had to be killed, because even if Musashi had killed great many of the Yoshioka men, as long as their chief was still alive, he could not be considered to have won the battle. Thus, he had to kill the chief before he was exhausted. That is why he attacked Madison Chiro in the beginning of the combat, killing him with a single blow of his sword. Once the chief was dead, Musashi had to fight a multitude of enemies in order to get away. Although Musashi later defined his school as the school of two swords, he fought a great many duels with only one sword. During his fight with the Yoshioka men, he drew both swords spontaneously in order to face as many adversaries while moving rapidly over the irregular terrain. This third confrontation marked the end of the branch of the Yoshioka family. Yeah, pretty crazy. Yeah, so a quick recap. First duel. Uh, in fact, the one that I just read you didn't go over a, a couple of details. Uh, so the first one that he, the first match of the, with the Yoshiokas was what was was with uh, Sejiro. So uh, Yoshioka Sejiro was the head of the school. Sejiro was known to have exceptional concentration skills, whatever that means. Maybe he just knew how to be super present. Hits him, disables his arm. Sejiro becomes a monk. And then his brother, Denshinchiro, challenges Musashi. And Musashi takes Denshinchiro's weapon away from him and kills him with it. Then. The younger brother, which is 12 or 13 years old, challenges him and they decide to jump Musashi. So dozens of people are, are going after him. What Musashi does, so the first two matches, he showed up late. And so the third match, they assumed he was going to show up late, but he decided to show up early. So he shows up early, scopes things out, eyes how many people have guns and how many people have bows, finds the right, right opportunity, barges in, kills the the boy um, who's the chief you know this is a different time you had to take out the chief in the beginning or if you didn't take the chief out you probably would not 
have won. So he needed to do that before he was too exhausted from fighting multiple other people. So he rushes in, kills him. Uh, in the novel, you know, the boy is right up against a tree and he, from what I remember, he cuts through, chops his head off. Mm -hmm.